All right, so Michael Wan, you are back in the house for, I guess, a second time here, or maybe a third time. We chatted quite a bit about the Susquehanna alchemy research that you've done. But regardless, welcome back. Thank you, and thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here, Ryan. Yeah, no problem, man. And we should note to the listener that you're driving right now. So if there's any sort of background noise or hiccup in the audio here, that is why. But bear with us because we're going to be talking about something that's, I think, pretty fascinating that you sent me via email the other day, just sort of randomly. And I was like, okay, this has to be a podcast recording. But before we get into that, I I want to start with a quick disclaimer for the audience. We are going to be talking about the Kavanaugh Ford hearing here the 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 story that's gone on in media for the last few weeks with them but we're talking about it i guess mike more on a like would you say a a psychological symbolic archetypal level here we're not dismissing the allegations or the claims of anyone involved you know we recognize the uh systemic cultural problems that this story highlights we're just not talking about them directly i guess you could say we're looking at the story in a more occulted way you know the the layers sort of beyond the mainstream of what this story may represent. Is, is that fair to say, Mike? I think that's a great way to, to frame this up. And I think that's important also because um, what we're going to talk about, I, I find fascinating, but then it's easier for, for me. And what we're going to do today is to disconnect ourselves emotionally from this story, which is being presented on, um, the public forum and look at it from a detached perspective and very much from an occult perspective. Uh, and so for, for, for listeners, um, if this is, if this is something which, which you are emotionally tied into for whatever reason, this, this will probably stir things up. But then on the flip side, what I'm hoping we can also get into is explain how and why this is getting people so worked up as well. Yeah, that is a fair uh, thing to say as well. I'm glad that you threw that out there. And to be honest, Mike, I haven't had really any time to prepare for this chat. I am just working off of the email notes that you've sent me. So I'm going to just kind of turn things over to you and then I'll jump in if I have questions or want to add anything as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the best place to start is at your son's soccer game. (laughs) All right. So this started last Saturday and I was talking to two other fathers who um, real interesting, real interesting people. And we're talking about, you know, what what everyone's talking about, that that uh, uh, what's going on with this hearing and. One of the one of the guys, and I'm 47 years old, so we're all around the same age, and this puts us in Generation X. They said it seems like the entire 1980s is on trial, and <clears throat> immediately what popped in my head was this is the continuation or the sequel to the movie this to the movie 16 Candles. And this was Saturday. And what's interesting about this is two days later, um, which came out on on the uh, the national scene, was the star from Sixteen Candles began to talk about the role of these movies and what what sort of uh, values they they um, they presented on to adolescents at that time and, and that sort of stuff. And what's interesting is the time and why I bring this up now is the timeliness. <clears throat> I posted the initial thoughts about this on Saturday. And then it was two days later that, that the, the, the Molly Ringwald story came in. So I want to frame up, well, let, let me even take a step back. We're going to be looking at this event in maybe a similar way as you might look at the Steve Jackson Illuminati card game. Are you familiar with that, I assume? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, hey, so it's... Well, hold, you, hold on. For, for the listeners who aren't, maybe just give a brief description of what the game is, how it relates to culture here, and I guess uh, just continue on with Okay. Your, yeah. So there was a, there was a, 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 a fantasy card game... Um, which I want to say came out in the nineties uh, credited to Steve Jackson, who puts out a lot of games and it's called the Illuminati game. And, and each card has a different, um, 
a different uh, 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 technique in the Illuminati playbook to take over the world. And the reason why this card game, particularly in the last uh, 17 years, post 9-11 world, has gotten so much attention is because so many aspects of this card game seemingly has played out in material reality, which opens up <clears throat> a lot of questions as, you know, is this predictive programming? Is this some sort of magic? Is this scripted? And, and really, I, you know, there's no answer to that. And what we're going to talk about with the Kavanaugh hearing is going to be like that in the fact that I'm not suggesting that the Kavanaugh hearing is completely scripted. I'm not suggesting it's not scripted. I'm not saying they are real people or they're lifetime actors or, or maybe this is all happening synchronistically. I don't know. But what I am going to do is point out where there are very, very strong correlations between what we're seeing on our computer screens and what we are at least a part of the population, which is familiar with with the movies of John Hughes from the 80s, how these correspond, and then also what the effects would be on the individual, the targeted individual, and then also the collective. So I want to begin by framing up the, uh, the Kavanaugh hearing in just a very general sense. What we're seeing is... Um, We've got, we've got what I'm going to call two actors. And again, I'm not doing this to, to, to belittle anything, but, but this is how, I, how we can approach it in a non-emotional way. We have Kavanaugh, and he kind of represents um, drunken frat boy. From, well, Brett, uh, Brett, Brett Kavanaugh, from, Brett, not, from the not 80s. And then, we have Cav, or, and then we have Ford. And what's coming into play is this, this night in question in the 1980s, and this this party, this high school party, and it is uh, associated with more or less rich, affluent white kids. Now we're and we're going to be switching gears back and forth, going from from uh, uh, what we're going to call material reality, and then uh, John John Hughes reality. So we need a little bit of flexibility, but we're working on the subconscious mind, and this is how the subconscious works. It's it's nonlinear. We can go back and forth. Um, so when we as a listener begin to hear something like this 1980s party, this, is, this happens to everyone. This is just how the human mind works, is we begin to create in our mind a picture of what we think this is. And we will pull from all of the different aspects of our own experience. Now, ideally, this is going to hit most people who were in high school during that time period. So there's going to be a combination of their own, their own, and this is all unconscious, this is all unconscious, their own experiences in high school parties. But then there's also a collective um, memory, which we can uh, give to Hollywood. And as probably all the listeners are aware of in this audience is just the role of Hollywood and magic and, and that general sort of sense. So building off of that, there's one person in particular who is best known and, and most credited for painting in the minds of the collective consciousness um, 1980s high school life. And this is the filmmaker, the writer-director, John Hughes. I believe he passed away like in the last five years or so. And he's best known for movies like The Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, Sixteen Candles, Pretty in Pink. He also did the Home Alone franchises and National Lampoon Vacation. So you get a general idea of his body of work. And the, tying this back to, to Kavanaugh, um, we have this night in question, which is um, this, this high school party in in white affluent suburbia and that lines up perfectly with this this film 16 candles and for those 
who are not familiar with 16 Candles, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that movie for a, a moment. Um, it tells the story of a, of a girl and her 16th birthday and being forgotten on that. And what John Hughes was very, very uh, respected for as a filmmaker was his ability to show high school characters with a lot of emotional depth. And the movie is about this main character and her, her journey, Samantha. Now, the secondary story or, or the backdrop is um, about her and her, her crush on uh, more or less the, uh, the male apex of the social um, hierarchy in their high school. And so the movie um, more or less climaxes with a party which happens in, in, at, this, this, uh, at her crush's house, and his name is Jake. And within this movie, Jake's girlfriend, who's more or less a tertiary character, but she is the main character as it relates to our Kavanaugh sequel, she goes through a very traumatic event. And so his girlfriend is more or less, she's the, she's the queen bee of the school, and she is a representation of all that's nasty about about high school female social cliques. She's she's um, she's absolutely beautiful, but she's mean and she's nasty, and she gets everything she wants. So on the night of this party, uh, three things happen to this character, whose name happens to be in the movie Caroline Mulford. So again, when we begin to think about on the subconscious with nonlinear connections, there is a slight resonance with the name Christine Blase Ford. It's, it's, it's not strong, but this is how the subconscious works. It is still there with the Ford and the Ford and the C and the C, uh, sounding consonants of the first name. So within the movie, uh, this character, she had, she's traumatized first by having her hair cut off by her girlfriends because it's, she is, uh, she's very drunk and it gets stuck in the, um, in the door. So that's the first thing that's happening. We want to begin to think about this as it relates to um, this character as an actual individual, because what we're witnessing is a psychodrama, which is being afflicted upon the general population. And so the first thing is the, the hair chopping. The second thing is this, this, uh, uh, the, the, I'm just going to call her the prom queen. The prom queen is then, uh, dumped by her boyfriend, who is Jake. And what Jake does to her is he pawns her off to the school geek, who's played by Anthony Michael Hall. And he basically says, listen, you got to take my girlfriend home. Uh, she's really drunk. You can have your way with her. No one's going to remember anything. So again, now we're beginning to start to see how this ties into um, this 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 Ford story of now we're dealing with some with rape issues, and then it cuts to uh, the next scene where the prom queen wakes up in a car with the geek, and she wakes up very confused. She's like, "How did I get here?" You know, it was a, a, a night of, of of drunkenness. And she's like, who are you? How did I get here? And then suddenly her, her attitude begins to change. And her attitude changes. Uh, and she's like, did we have sex last night? And, and the geek, he, he's like, yeah, yeah, we did. And then she starts to get this kind of like wry smile on her face. And she is, she's like, wow, that was, that was, a, that was really good, wasn't it? And, and they, they begin to almost kind of cuddle in afterglow. So that is the story, and that's how it's presented in 16 Candles. And I want to do one, one, uh, um, one, one side right now. That motif was also expressed in another movie geared at the same audience, uh, Adolescence 1980s, uh, where... A, a, uh, in the movie, it's called The Revenge of the Nerds, which was also very popular if you're familiar with it. But basically, the same thing happens. This nerdy guy, he um, more or less rapes the cheerleader under false pretenses. He was under a, in a costume. And then once she realizes who he is, rather than getting upset and angry, what she does is she's like, wow, that was, you know, that was really good sex. And so 
we're seeing these are the motifs that were introduced to the adolescence, uh, both male and female, uh, in the 80s, which is primarily Generation X. So now fast forward, what we're seeing, at least from one perspective, what we're seeing with the Kavanaugh hearing and um, is the character, and these are composite characters, so they're made up from a couple different char- of, of from the Hughes films. We're seeing their day in court. And we are, we are seeing um, what would happen 30 years later after these instances. And what I'm going to suggest what's, what's happening is what's generally referred to as psychodrama. And psychodrama, similar to neuro-linguistic programming, is a, a therapeutic technique which um, which communicates with the subconscious of the person. And this could be done overtly or purposefully in a healthy the- uh, a therapeutic session, but it, these both of these techniques can be done covertly and in what's basically known as dark hypnosis for the... Um, and they both are effective. And what they're effective at doing is bringing repressed emotions and memories to the surface. And when this is done in a way which benefits someone, it allows them to act out and experience the emotions which have been repressed so that they can be experienced and eventually reconciled with and moved on. So, okay, let's go um, and look at the prom queen. And we're going to look at her from like a real person perspective because our subconscious does not necessarily separate um, reality from fiction. We take everything as literal. And so an example of that would be if you watch a suspenseful film or TV show And your conscious mind knows you're just watching a TV show, but there's a part of you that doesn't. And that's what makes your heart go. You're feeling this treasure part of you that identifies with the character. You you put it. All right. It looks like we lost Mike there for a moment. Mike, can you still hear me? Hmm. Put it. All right, Ryan, are you still there? Yeah, we're still there. Uh, Just. uh kind of restart that thought about the subconscious taking everything seriously because you cut out for a large portion of that. Okay. Um, So in order to really appreciate what's being, what's happening and and how, how the, uh, um, how this, this Kavanaugh Ford hearing is affecting people on a much, much deeper personal level you have to understand a little bit about how the subconscious works and so the subconscious takes everything literally and our conscious mind particularly when we're watching um fiction or reading fiction we our conscious mind knows that this is fiction but our subconscious it doesn't it takes everything literally and the subconscious takes everything in and so i'll give you an example um if you watch something, uh, a, a suspenseful film, if you watch a suspenseful film, you know it's not real, but there's a part of you that does think it's real. And that's the part of you that makes your heart race or it, it makes you, 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 you grip your fist tight in tension because there's part of you that feels like this is real. And the more one identifies with the character which you are watching, the more real it seems to become and all of this is stored in the in the subconscious so when we're watching psychodrama when when a psychodrama is happening it is um it's trying to pull out it's trying to pull out and pull to the surface these deep kind of forgotten repressed emotions so now let's further link the prom queen with dr ford So let's assume that the prom queen is a real person. And let's say those events actually happen to the real person. A fair 
assessment of what would happen is that night would have been completely repressed. The reason why it would be repressed is two reasons. It was it was probably filled with great shame, uh, particularly for someone who has the psychological profile who's very dominating, which she was. She was the queen bee. She lost face by having her hair cut, by being dumped, and then more, and then being raped by the, the school geek. And then she also was was passed out drunk. So you take all of those things. It's going to be repressed, probably. If that were to happen in real life, that character would come back, and she would she would somehow position herself as even stronger than before. And then sometime later, sometime later in this person's life, they would begin to have indications of that trauma begin to show itself in their real life and it would need to come out and that's going to come out unconsciously and then and then arguably through through therapy through you know through some some very effective means one can bring that out so it can be addressed and released but if it's not done in a in a in a strong way what the subconscious does is it ha- it 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 shows itself in um uh, in these unconscious, unserving ways, it acts them out. And so what I'm going to suggest is happening is we are seeing this psychodrama pull out these deep, buried, traumatic events, both fictional and possibly very real within primarily the targeted group, which is going to, what I'm going to say is going to be female generation Xers. And so two things are happening is the, the 16 candles is going to create a collective memory, which is going to be really in anyone who is of a certain age group who watched that film. And they're going to have connected themselves one way or another um, with with this prom queen and also with Sam, that's why, or the, uh, the Molly Ringwald character, that's why it's a composite character. But then also if they have anything within their own history, their own actual history, it's all going to be kind of blended together and it's going to pull this out or pull things to the surface. And what we're seeing happening is the more of these different connections, which are happening on the stage of the, Kavanaugh um, hearing, the the more this is pulling it to the um, surface of the viewer, which I'm going to suggest is really adding to the emotional response of what we're seeing on the on the national on the national level right now. So I want to go a little bit. I want to go a little bit. Let me first give you an opportunity to ask me some clarifying questions because I know that could have been confusing. And then I'd like to go a little bit deeper with what we're seeing in the material world and then how it triggers directly back to 1980s um, uh, 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 popular culture. Yeah, well, I think – I mean I follow the narrative of what you're laying down here pretty well. I don't have anything to clarify about that. But I do have a question about – I guess, you know, is this psychodrama then, would you see this as a nefarious thing if it's pulling these traumas out of the targeted demographic here? Or is that is that ultimately a positive thing so we can address these as, as individuals and the collective as well? Bro, that's the million dollar question now, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> at the, uh, the most important question a person can ask is, is the world, is the universe a friendly or a dangerous place? Um, I can understand both sides of the equa- on the equation. And in a lot of ways, this is, this is spiritual alchemy. This is the conversion of, of what wounds us into something that strengthens us. Um, on one level, on like a very high level, I'm like, yeah, this is really bringing people through a process, an alchemical process. Um, but then on maybe one level, Beneath that, maybe even more of this time frame, yeah, this can be very nefarious because what we're seeing happening is this is very much what's what what's what will happen when in a scenario like this, whether this is in in just someone's individual life or in this collective life, is it is releasing the energy of rage. 
because ultimately shame is directly connected with all repression. One is shameful about it. And shame is a very, very powerful emotional energy and experience. And when shame is eventually cracked open and allowed to be expressed, it comes out through rage. And that's what we're seeing. And, you know, everyone has their own opinions as what's going on in America right now. But um, there is a strong history of, of, of utilizing, of political operatives utilizing collective emotional energy for whatever purposes. Um, so I can see both. I'm ultimately an optimist and I think it's always for the best. But, but yeah, there, that, that's part of the complexity of, of living in these times and trying to navigate what's going on. Well, that's the thing that confuses me the most, obviously, because I do think that pulling traumas to the surface so that they can be addressed, whether it is individually or in a group setting, is ultimately empowering because you ha you have to be able to move on from them and you don't know exactly how they affect you unless you pull them out of yourself and you know sort of analyze how these events that you've experienced ha have affected you. But... Again, you know, I see that too uh, from the angle that you just laid out as well. So, let's get you, back. You're, abso to, you're absolutely right. You're you're absolutely. And I, I like to think once you understand this model, uh, you see it over and over. And this is the basic model behind MK Ultra um, Monarch programming, which is basically a weaponized version of this process where extreme trauma is created under a specific um, uh, um, set of circumstances for the goal of creating a uh, very, very um, specific uh, skill sets, whether that's like Jason Bourne to become like the ultimate uh, uh, um, military machine or, or all these different sort of things. But when you do your MK Ultra, when you read about MK Ultra and you read about this type of, of psychology, you realize that the majority of people don't make it through. For every single person that makes it through, and you know, you could go and say, like, you know, this is this is beneficial, you know, quote unquote, because one comes out with a certain new skill or strength or they're stronger than before. A lot of people don't make it through. Now that's MK Ultra. But the same thing is true as we're real, as we're dealing with or addressing um, large scale psychological operations. For some people, I think that this is going to probably it could be a very beneficial thing. But for other people, it's not. And when we when they you hear the term trigger, like so, trigger has a lot of different connotations. But when it's generally used, when someone says I've been triggered, that means they're unconsciously worked up on a vulnerable area which they have not addressed with, and they and they they go into fight or flight mode. You know, triggers also MK Ultra, like you put on an altar. But if the person is served by this, I agree with you. This is a very positive thing. And maybe on the collective, it's a positive. But on the individual level, there probably are going to be casualties. And what I mean by casualties, people who are really thrown off their emotional center. Yeah, and well, oh, from sorry, a level sorry. of, is this nefarious? From a political perspective where, you know, there, there could be some nefarious type reasons for whatever, I'm like, the purpose is to keep people off their center. It's always been the case. You know, when you keep someone off their center, it's easiest to lead them. Mike, are you aware so of... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go right ahead. I was going to say, are you aware of some of the more, I guess, and let's call them real world things that may be also buried with this story and I, i'm talking specifically about and these are things i've read on reddit and 4chan so let me just preface this with that and i'm not okay i don't have all the details i don't remember all the details this is me just browsing and reading about it but um but there are things you know like uh kavanaugh is a is a bush guy you know so there's some there's some immediate trepidation there with that and by Bush guy, I mean I, I mean George Bush, George H.W. Uh, Bush and <laughs> right, George right, W. Right. Bush. And then Blazy Ford apparently also is a really shitty landlord and yeah. that they're, they're sort of using this event also to cover up some 
I guess, illegalities that both have participated in to sort of draw attention away from that. Now, I don't know if all that's true, but that could be a more like, let's, let's get out of the deeper hidden layer here and just go back up to the surface, you know, for a moment. That could be another aspect to this is that it could just be real people talking real shit about something that, that really happened between them. But using it as sort of a, a mechanism to distract from what else is going on in their lives. And I personally don't know much about, like I said, what I'm trying to talk about here. But I've seen that before in the sense that, like, they'll, both sides essentially agree on, like, 95% of their politics. It's the 5% they disagree on that gets th- uh, thrown out and highlighted in media. So they may use these sorts of things as distraction mechanisms from those sorts of things that are going on behind the scenes and, you know, as you say, play out this psychodrama on TV so that they're not looking for these other stories that they may be involved in behind the scenes. So I don't know if you know anything about this stuff that I've thrown out here. Like I know, the- I know a little bit, and I'm, I'm, in to, I'm in complete agreement with you in the fact that there are multiple levels of and when i say reality i mean that in every sense of the word like just like what people choose to focus on and then like you know interdimensional stuff there's so many things that are happening simultaneously with this story and depending upon where one meets it or approaches it like yes all of that is true um i'm particularly intrigued by the kavanaugh connection with kenneth Starr and all of that sort of stuff But then again, this is my personal opinion. This is my personal opinion. Um, I don't buy any of the politics. I believe believe it's all – this goes a little bit to what your your conversation was with with Tracy Twynan um, last week as she was talking about AI and computers. And – we are at such a we are at a place right now in our 3D material reality where re, that that really anything is possible and what we see like what becomes our reality is just given to us from screens and we have to always take that in consideration and we also and I'm not necessarily saying this is true I'm just saying this is a possibility um, everything which we see on the internet um, it's the easiest stuff to go and create. Like the internet, whether that's done by bots, whether that's done by sentient AI, whether that's done by political operatives, whether it's not done at all, I don't know. But all of those are potentialities and all of these background stories are very easy to be created on the medium known as the internet or even TV for that. So I always like to hold that as part of trying to navigate reality as well, because as, as CIA uh, uh, um, uh, director William Casey infamously said, um, you will know that they have completed their counterintelligence operat- operative operation when no one knows what is real and what is false. Yeah, so I want to get back into, um, I guess, what you were calling how this is playing out in the material reality. Is is this connected to what you were just saying, or is it, is that something else? So it's, yes, yes. Okay, so let's go back to let's go back to material reality, and let's go back to like uh, because what I like is we're we're, we're 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 talking theoretics, but I like to ground it in something tangible because we're trying to navigate and understand what we're seeing. So. What we saw in the real world movie of um, Kavanaugh and Ford, and um, we saw Alyssa Milano who goes and she sits right behind, she's sitting behind Kavanaugh, and she's filming him with his smartphone. And this again, this is a motif which is used throughout um, throughout Hollywood, which I always think is a big mind fuck because you're whenever you're dealing with like the movie in the movie. You know, you're, the, the subconscious mind gets confused by that because you're like, what's real and what's not real? 
Um, and we're seeing that with her filming this thing, which we're supposedly witnessing. And the reason why Alyssa Milano is of interest is because she also plays a strong pop culture psychological trigger. Um, and what it's doing is it's further connecting the unconscious to 80s pop culture. It was introduced through like the idea of there's a 1980s movie or a 1980s party. And we will naturally, the viewer will naturally connect it with John, the John Hughes landscape coupled with their own personal landscape. Um, you have all of these sort of like connections, general nonlinear connections to the movie 16 Candles. The subconscious works nonlinearly. We've got Alyssa Milano. Alyssa Milano was introduced to the collective through a TV show called Who's the Boss, which came out right around the same time at 16 Candles. This is all early 1980s. The character's name, which she played in Who's the Boss, is the same name as the character the main character of 16 Candles was played by Molly Ringwald. So, so the, the Ford character is a composite character of both the Molly Ringwald, um, which is kind of like the, the, the vulnerable, nerdy um, uh, uh, Molly Ringwald, but then also with this prom queen, because it was the prom queen who really was, was traumatized and raped. And so it's this composite story. And then the Samantha and the story she's basically telling is that of the woman who, who was traumatized, the prom queen. But now we have a Melissa Milano in the background and we've got this connection with Samantha. It's the same name. There's a trigger. It's the same time period. It's early 80s. And even more interesting, um, the notion behind this TV show, who's the boss, is that of was played by Tony Danza for anyone who, 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 who that is, was this kind of like uber masculine, uh, uh, Brooklyn kind of guy. And he takes a housekeeper role working for a single, um, highly successful businesswoman. So you have this introduction of these role reversals, um, at play and you have uh, Alyssa Milano who is and this was a, an immensely popular show at its time um, she is the daughter raised uh, the daughter of Tony Danza raised in this environment so again <clears throat> assuming that's a real person who would that character be as an adult but someone who is very comfortable standing up to very, very strong men because um, that was the environment she, she was raised in. And so we see Alyssa Milano, you know, whether we want to say she's a lifetime actor, whether you want to say this is just symbolic, I don't know. But she's doing just that. She's standing right behind him. She's like, you know, I'm not intimidated by any of this. I got this camera on here. And so we see that triggers playing out as well. Um, I suggest Kavanaugh is a composite character of... Um, of both this the 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 alpha male wrestler in the John Hughes film. This is both the Jake character and then probably the wrestler from from the Breakfast Club, another popular John Hughes film. But then also the the geeky character, as you know, he seems to be the uh, um, the uh, um, well, actually both of them are 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 played a role in terms of the prom queen's trauma. And so we're seeing all of these different archetypes being played out, whether this is done consciously or whether this is done magically or whether this is uh, synchromistically, I don't know. These are the same themes that are happening. Um, I want to not go too far down, but I want to show you how weird all of this gets for a moment. Um, are you familiar with, with the work of John Hughes? Like, do you know his movies? Oh, for sure, man. I love, love, love Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which is not really connected to what we're talking about, but it is my favorite John Hughes movie. But yeah, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, for sure. So so Ferris Bueller's Day Off is, uh, if you recall how that film was done, like you will often see when we watch movies, 
that something happens where a viewer, we're thinking we're watching it from like, you know, a third party perspective. But then every once in a while, they don't do this in all movies, but some filmmakers do it. And Ferris Bueller is a great example is they look at the camera and they talk to the audience. And sometimes it's mm-hmm. subtle and sometimes it's specific. <clears throat> but that's a very, very powerful psychological um, uh, technique. But I want to talk about the movie Weird Science. Did you ever see the movie Weird Science? Yes, I did, for sure. Okay. So in prep for this interview uh, or this conversation which we're having, I watched Weird Science again yesterday because that was the John Hughes film that came out that came out after uh, the um, after Sixteen Candles, and it seems to be this trium this this triumphant of films of Breakfast Club, Sixteen Candles, and um, Weird Science, which are all built around uh, Anthony Michael Hall. So you got to watch the first fifteen minutes of Weird Science because what you see is. Um, Quant, you, you see basically what happens in weird science is you have these two geek guys who are inspired by watching Frankenstein to create a um, to create a, uh, a, a female, a woman. And that's the, the weird science. Now, when you that's how I remembered it. When I watched the details last night, there's references to quantum computers. There is ritual magic in it there is um all sorts of connections to to uh you know the ancient techniques and the reason why i find that so interesting is like this is the same guy who did 16 candles and what though it's presented in tongue-in-cheek fashion in weird science this is obviously well within the consciousness of this filmmaker and what we're kind of flirting with in this conversation is, you know, just out of a culture where a cult and culture are, are how and where they overlap. And we're seeing this so incredibly strong with, with, um, with John Hughes. And I want to explain the, the, the quantum computer, indication in this in one of the opening scenes so these guys are are they go into this 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 is 1985 they go into this cad cam software to to create um a a fictional female they're creating her body and they're like we don't have enough computing power so it shows them do this old-fashioned modem i mean it's crazy to watch this now where he takes an old-fashioned phone and actually puts it on a on the modems where it's all analog where the sounds are are um picked up and sent over the landlines and then it quickly shows that they connect to this military um this military mainframe computer and then it shows from the perspective if they were in the computer and they're going through all of these like tunnels and they finally were able to get into this computer and then suddenly the the visuals it's really kind of hokey but it's funny to watch in our modern world it shows um clocks going backwards it shows einstein equals mc squared all these kind of visuals but all of these indications of quantum computing you know, that's Einstein's the, you know, directly connect, connected to quantum mechanics and, and all of this understanding. And it's tied to computers. This is, you know, 20 years before the advent of D-Wave or anything like that. And then it shows these guys, they connect from this, this quantum computer via electrodes to a Barbie doll with candles around her on this board, on the board game life because they're trying to bring life into her. And what happens next is they, oh, they, they have on their heads, they have bras on their heads with the uh, cups on the top of their head and it's bound under their chin where the strap is. And I'm looking at that. I'm like, that looks just like Aleister Crowley's triangular hat, which he is, wears where he's got his palms, um, that famous picture where he's got his, his, his chin rested on his palms except it's an inverted triangle as opposed to Crowley's which is pointed up and they're chanting in this this you know again this is all done tongue-in-cheek but if you understand 
the 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 occultic nature of Hollywood and our people, they're they're tapping right into this. And they're showing these guys using what I'm saying is like Phoenician rituals to bring life into this um this doll, this Barbie doll, um through these ancient techniques tied in with quantum computers, which is exactly what is at least we're theorizing is really happening right now. And so I bring that up and tie this back to the, um, to the Kavanaugh hearing because it's the same motifs. It's the same ideas. It's, 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 it's cutting edge technology. It is, it's showmanship. It's psychology. It is um, ancient rituals, and it's all being tied in, and it's playing out in front of us. The same, the same motifs, the same ideas, are 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 in play, and and it's all done in this this very very kind of. It's present when it's presented as fiction. It's always meant to go and bypass this is the beauty of fiction particularly when it's done by by masters of of the hollywood arts is it's meant to bypass the conscious mind to get into the unconscious for a variety of reasons and i'm suggesting those reasons are being ta- are being tapped into with this story with this Kavanaugh story before our eyes and there are so many pressure points, uh, subconscious psychological pressure points to bring out um, all of these different types of emotion. So we talked a little bit about, um, oh, you're going to ask me a question, but we talked a little bit about, about how at least for the, the person who is identifying with Ford, what is being brought to the surface is going to be rage. And I, and I want to hear your question, but then remind me that we want to go to how the Kavanaugh, what's being brought to the surface with the person who's identifying with Kavanaugh. Well, this may be connected to what I wanted to ask you now, actually, because I wanted okay. you to talk more about how this is deepening the chasm between men and women and then this idea of toxic masculinity versus toxic femininity. Is that what you were trying to get at? Uh, it's all connected. So yes. So, so we'll jump right in. So, um, so generally speaking, if you want to go and look at mainstream culture in the United States right now, and then, and then link it in directly to the Kavanaugh story is, is we're seeing, uh, one is really any, let's take a couple steps back. So we have the United States or really any country, any group of people, um, uh, we can think of them as a whole, you know, we can see it as one big unified group. And then we have all of these different fissures or lines where we can separate one group from another. Uh, and there are infinite ways to do that. You can do it by gender. You could do it by sexual orientation, by religious belief, by sports team affiliation, all of this sort of stuff. But what we've really been seeing over the past couple of years is more and more and more pressure being placed upon these fissures. I mean, that's what's happening. It's cracking and we're seeing that and it's separating these different groups and it's creating chasms between them. They just don't relate. Um, so one of the, one of what I, one of the, the subtextual themes of the Kavanaugh story, uh, is toxic masculinity versus toxic femininity. And again, we're talking about this from a non-emotionally, non-morally, non-ethically um, uh, slanted perspective, but just like looking at it from a, a understanding two sides of the story. And, and what what's so interesting, in my opinion, in watching this is the exact same testimony will strengthen both sides argument so when kavanaugh is up there and he is is uh, 
getting heated and angry, if someone is a, so is is aligned with Ford, like if they identify with this with 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 that particular perspective, like look at this guy. He's your stereotypical angry white male, and and he's demonstrating all of these behaviors. And the same person who's watching that who supports Kavanaugh is like, damn straight, he's angry. It's been 30 years and she's going to come with this story. I'd be angry, too. And then likewise, when 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 Ford is testifying and the thing which really jumped out in my mind, she was asked these questions about the polygraph test, which she took right before right before her allegations first came out. And they're asking, well, did that happen um, did that happen um, uh, the day that you were back in the D.C. area for a funeral or the next day? She's like, oh, I don't really remember. And this was just like, you know, relatively short period of time. And she was unable in her memory to tell if these events happen on the same day or not, which to every Kavanaugh supporter is like, look, that's proof that this woman's memory is whacked. And it's proof to like any Kavanaugh supporters, like, look how traumatized this woman is. Like, rightfully so, she's confused, um, which is ironic. I'm literally at the exact same place uh, right by the BWI airport where she supposedly gave, um, gave her, her polygraph. So what we're seeing is this toxic masculinity and toxic femininity uh, play out. And the toxic masculinity is is entitlement and assertiveness and aggressiveness, which without any understanding of boundaries and toxic femininity is playing out, which is like uh, over emotionality, uh, maybe manipulation of memory, stuff like that. I'm not saying either of these things are occurring. I'm just saying these are the, the subtextual ideas in the hearts and minds of the people who are watching this and really emotionally tied into it. And what's happening is with all of this psychodrama, which is meant to activate the, the subconscious, but in a way that you don't realize it. So it's really going to be um, uh, unleashing uh, uncontrollable emotion versus if it's done overtly and purposefully, it's controlled emotion. Um, we're also seeing this happen on the male side because or, or the Kavanaugh side, because we're seeing the rage and the anger with with the, the the Ford testimony. We're really getting the fighter in 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 the Kavanaugh and that worked up. And the reason why that's happening is in the same time we're seeing the 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 Kavanaugh trial. There's also the biggest um, uh, UFC or Ultimate Fighting Championship um, bout occurring, and they're both dealing with uh, um, with uh, um, Irish Catholic men, Conor McGregor, and um, and. Um, I'm sorry, Ryan. Let me let me pause for one second because I don't know where the fuck I am and I can't drive and think at the same time. <laughs> That's fine, man. I'm That's gonna, fine. Um, let me see. What's happening is um, this this pressure uh, to really bring out the fighter in the Kavanaugh in the person who's identifying with Kavanaugh. It doesn't matter if whether or not the same person who's identifying with 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 Kavanaugh is also a UFC fan or not. What's interesting is on the collective major emotional, um, major emotions are being pumped up at the same time. And there is a, um, and there are subconscious, subcon, subconscious contextual connections. And we're seeing that through this Irish Catholic, uh, on a deeper level, McGregor's, uh, his manager's last name is Kavanaugh. And then they both occurred on the same night. So the, the Kavanaugh fight or the Kavanaugh uh, conclusion of the hearing happened yesterday, which is the same day of the Conor McGregor fight. And then they both had this strange connection with, um, 
with alcohol uh, in the Conor McGregor um, uh, press conference. There was this really strange connection where he keeps on talking about his brand of whiskey, which he was promoting called proper 12. And it really didn't fit into the, it didn't really fit into the, um, it didn't fit into the, the press conference, and it was odd. In the exact same way, Kavanaugh's love of beer, oh, I love beer, was played out. So we have these connections, and they're happening. And it's really, really, um, it's really interesting to notice the different psychological cues and pressures which are being placed upon these different segments. Uh, interestingly enough, um, we saw Conor McGregor lost the fight and that also had a, a kind of crusades, um, aspect to it for his opponent was, um, was Muslim. So, and, and there was this kind of Catholic versus Muslim sort of thing going on as you're having this male female going on with Kavanaugh who seemingly won that battle. I'm also not suggesting that these are predictive, uh, events. I'm just noticing that they're happening and they're very, very deeply intertwined. Well, and then also, did you see what happened in the post fight last night? Oh, absolute pandemonium. Yeah. And it was also so so if we're going to look if we're looking at these things from um from this kind of perspective of like okay, this is there's something which is happening on these the substrates of reality. And so we have the substrates of our personal reality which is our all of our own individual subconsciouses, and then we have substrates of our collective reality, but but they're kind of similar. So when we see this, we we see things that are unusually happening. Um, we're we're, lo- we're looking for the outliers. Those are big indicators, and the pandemonium that happened afterwards was um, unlike any other of these UFC b- bouts. So we're seeing an outlier right there of spilled over um anger rage violence whatever you want to call it uh i'm interested to see you know what happens with the spilling over now of the kavanaugh hearing will there be any i don't know i don't i'm not making predictions i'm just watching and adding commentary we're doing color commentary more than anything else i would just i would say yeah i would say so too do you think you know, because there was a uh, there was a fan that jumped that cage last night and started just wailing on McGregor during this whole melee, this post fight melee. Do you see any sort of I don't know, maybe like socio political motivations here that may be in play, like in terms of security issues or other things so- that may be brought up because of this? That you know, maybe just like kind of like going back to the AI stuff and the surveillance and this, this sort of, sort of like restricting freedoms. Do you think that that may have some sort of effect on just a more, you know, surface level here that there might be some, uh, that might be a, an excuse for people to, I guess, increase security and surveillance at, at, uh, crowded events here. It's funny too, that this happened, uh, almost one year after the Vegas shooting last year too, by the way. There you go. There you go. And the, and the Vegas shooting, it's like multiple, and that has multiple layers also, um, I, I would say, you know, as, as you know, they used to say when I was coming up, all that in a bag of chips, right? I think it's all of those things. Um, I didn't realize that the person who who hit McGregor was a fan. I thought he was. I thought he was part of uh, the opponent's um, his entourage. But if it's his fan, well, I would say that's even stranger. I don't know who it was because nobody identified him, but he looks like he came from the crowd. He wasn't dressed like he was part of the entourage, unless he was part of the entourage that was just in the crowd. But it looks like the video that I saw, he just came from the crowd, jumped the cage, and he landed in the cage behind McGregor and just started hitting him in the back of the head. Yeah. So, yeah, I saw that too. It was, I don't, it was yeah, but unprecedented I, and wild. I didn't... I, I didn't watch the fight live. I saw all this actually this morning because I I didn't pay pay any mind to it last night either. But uh, I just thought it was an More interesting the schedule. Yeah. I did this morning as well. Right, right. So, well, you I mean this UFC thing you mentioned in your email to me before this fight that there was this sort of connection there, and then just what happened afterwards last night is sort of a, this is like a raw reaction here to trying to connect the dots on 
what that post fight scrum may be about as well. So, is there any deeper meaning to that? I I don't know, but you're you're, you're better I, well, at well from a more general sense. If you, I mean, just the very fact that it's called the octagon, right? You know that we're <coughs> that whether consciously or not, we're dealing with archetypical symbology. You know, we're dealing with the octagon. We're dealing with the number eight. We're dealing with all, it, it has deeper sort of things. Now we have like gladiator type of, it's, it's a very, very strong um, subconscious uh, entity, the UFC and this rise in popularity over the last decade of mixed martial arts. Um, and it's also coming simultaneously as the deconstruction of um of masculinity uh or at least how culture define masculinity so we have like you know classes of of toxic masculinity and how to and and these healthier ways for for young men to learn how to deal with their natural masculine inclinations happening at the most in your face uh expression of of pure aggression is re uh, and no holds barred. It's not like boxing, you know. It's this is very different than Muhammad Ali and what we saw in the seventies, eighties, and even Mike Tyson. You know, this is this is as aggressive as you can get, and that is just exploding. And as you're tying this back into, uh, uh, you know, the the material reality, cultural creation, cultural control, they are undoubtedly related. Um, how specifically or how connected, I don't know. Um, there have been, I've seen a couple of videos and analysis which which look at the guy who's behind UFC as a um, as a MK Ultra monarch programmer um, handler of of Conor McGregor um, and this stuff that came out like a couple of years ago, and I found that very interesting. I don't know if I subscribe to that or not, but I see what they're saying. Um, and, and I, I definitely subscribe that elite athletes, um, are directly connected with, uh, that type of programming. Um, so it would make sense. Um, but to the degree, degree, I don't know. I'm very curious to see how the next couple of weeks play out. You know, is, is this just like, this just seems to be, you know, one more notch on the continually strange world, which we see unfolding. Or, you know, or is this like kind of like a watershed moment where something bigger is going to we're going to take it to the next level afterwards. So I just as what we're doing, we're just sitting on the perch watching and, and trying to make sense of it, but also recognizing the modus operandi, the, the method of operation, which is psychological, which is magical, which is ritual, which is all of these things, which is technological. I mean, I, I was watching the thing. Yes, I was watching this morning, the guy jumping over and I'm like, how do I know that's not CGI? I'm not saying it was, but how do I know it's not? You don't. We don't know what's real and what is fake unless you see it with your own eyes. And then it's even questionable. Yeah, I, um, I always, well, this may be my detriment as well as a, as a, a blessing the the blessing and the curse right is i like anything i see on a screen kind of like what you were uh talking about earlier i question immediately because i don't know if i'm being delivered something just that's just tailored for my eyes you know what i mean like based on my own browsing habits and all the data that they have on me all these internet companies uh isps and uh websites you know like they they have so much data like i work in marketing dude the, the, exactly. the, the, the amount of data that is at my disposal at any given moment is absurd. It's disgusting. So, it, 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 and that's just me in a marketing capacity. You know, that's not, I don't have access to everything you do on the internet like these ISPs do. But I guess my point is here is that not only do I question everything I see on a screen, I also liken it to a lifelong interest of mine, pro wrestling. I've talked about this uh, at length. You know, politics to me is pro wrestling. It's, it's uh, two two sides coming out to pretend like they have a difference, a beef that needs settled in the squared circle, which is what they call the ring in pro wrestling. So there's an occult reference right there. Without but, a doubt, uh, it's to, as free Masonic as you get, right? Exactly. So, the circle. exactly. So, 
but but backstage behind the curtain, these guys have plotted out a match, a physical confrontation, <coughs> and with a result that is also scripted. So I'm not saying everything you see on TV. Well, I think you should maybe approach everything you see you see on TV as just entertainment. Should, yes. It's just entertainment. All right. Even if there is some real world implications in your own life, it's just meant for your consumption. That's, I think, the the major point here about what you see on TV, politics included. Now, beyond that, just uh, just to stick with pro wrestling, uh, this was also yesterday, and it sort of encapsulates our entire thematic discussion here. The WWE put on a humongous show in Australia for the first time, I believe they said in 16 years. And the title of the show was Super Showdown. And I think when you look at the UFC fight, the Kavanaugh Ford, you know, fight I guess in the the uh, courtrooms here, is the Super Showdown is exactly what that sort of describes. So I thought that was an interesting connection to this as well. I agree with you completely, and it's it's funny as soon as you started talking about about pro wrestling. Arguably, and you know, I'm not a, a I'm not I'm not a, a historian a historian on pro wrestling. But I might make the argument that pro wrestling probably reached its cultural peak in maybe the 80s. Hulk Hogan, uh, WrestleMania, all that sort of stuff, which coincides, which overlaps directly with the same, jo- the same generation X, the same time period. And UFC is, old, is definitely like, you know, two, layer, two levels up, like... Um, it's very wrestling like, but it's as if wrestling were real. Well, yeah, as but if in they're the not s- pulling the punches. Well, yeah, but in the same sense that, like, we know that boxing matches have been fixed. They're definitely probably some. I mean, UFC has been suspected of this. Of, of course, they're a fixing fight. But I meant like right. the real but, punches. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, two real guys go out there and fighting each other, but you know, you tap out in the fourth round yes. because you're getting paid millions to do it, type of thing. Uh, and, and also when you look at UFC, like just like the, the way that their press conferences sort of transpire now, the stuff that leads up to the fight, the way they promote the fight, like Conor McGregor is, he would be great at pro wrestling in the eighties or nineties. He, he's like the epitome of a personality that would exceed or succeed in that environment. He's a great self promoter, right? Which is what makes any good pro wrestler or a good fighter in general you're good at self-promoting promoting your your bout or your fight or your match or whatever but the just the way that they handled these this promotion these press conferences leading up to the event and then you know the the post-fight conferences and everything that just surrounds the ufc now it's a psychodrama in and of itself akin to pro wrestling at least from my vantage point i don't know what you think about that but I would agree with, I agree with you completely. That's why I was saying like the octagon, like I I think the whole thing is whether or not it, whether or not it was purposefully created to capture a, um, the reason why I, I juxtaposed it towards the same time is one level of, of masculinity is being, um, uh, watered down on the culture there has to be a place to go and put the excess. They, uh, no, this is when you manage culture, when you manage society, like you can't, you can't deny natural human urges. You have to go. If you're going to go and tighten it up somewhere, you're going to go and give it somewhere else. So I'll give you an example. Like this is mostly done like through sexual, through sexual energy. So when you, when you see countries which have the most amount of totalitarianism as it relates to personal freedoms, there tends to be a complete opening of sexual mores. And likewise, when you have total freedom, there is a clampdown on sexual on sexual expression. So that's why you'll see like in communist Russia and all these sort of places. And you're seeing right now this like complete opening of of all things go sexually for this generation, which is coming up with like nonstop internet porn but they don't have any other freedoms, but they have that freedom. And so you're seeing the same thing with the masculinity where, where in one way it's being, um, it's not being allowed to be expressed, but then 
this extreme area it is being allowed to express even if you're 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 living through it via psychodrama like you're saying it's like okay now i get to really express what it's like to go in and and just like destroy another person you know that on a deep deep psychological level is being taken away and now you're able to go and and express it so yeah i think it's very connected and it's done probably if it, if it wasn't done purposefully, it had to have shown itself because that that energy needs to be expressed somehow. Unless yeah, you go and dilute it through um, all of the uh, hormones, through hormonal uh, um, changes in food and, and diet and stuff like that. That's another way which mm-hmm. which it's done. But we're witnessing all of that tied in with with the rise in, in AI and and just like what you're saying, like everything is known about us. Yeah, and social media, uh, definitely a, the, one of the primary vehicles for that expression that you're talking about. And also, I, I wanted to throw this at you real quick before we get out of here. Do you see any tie-in with the whole Kanye West Saturday Night Live thing from a week ago? Did you follow that story? Uh, a little bit. And I'm going to say I saw that like the big deal was that he was wearing a Trump hat and a Kaepernick um, jersey, correct? Uh, Is, yeah, I believe so. That specifically? Yeah, yeah. And then, and then the part that they cut out from the broadcast where he was performing with the cast on stage. I don't know when that was taking place. I didn't. I don't watch Saturday Night Live. I just again saw it on Sunday morning of last week. But uh, apparently, he had he had made a, a, a spiel on stage while he was um, getting ready to do a song. And was talking about, you know, he, he had the Trump MAGA hat on, talking about how, you know, they didn't want him to wear it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but then he started preaching about, you know, love and unity and some other, you know, I guess more positive messages. And talking about how media is so liberal, so controlled, blah, 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 blah. And then apparently the people that were filming in the audience posted this on their social media. I think Chris Rock, uh, from what I saw too, may have done it as well himself. But it was an interesting omission on the part of Saturday Night Live to cut that out from the broadcast. And, of course, the whole Kanye changing his name. I don't know much about this stuff. Again, I just I sort of read the stuff on Reddit uh, and 4chan on the, you know, like like after it all happens. So I'm not watching this. Stuff C- live, certainly. But... I, I, I tend to I we navigate the same way. I do the same way. So the, the Kanye, this is my personal opinion. So if you are on the international or national stage, you're a player. Uh, most likely you're, you're to one degree or another. And there, do you remember, I think it was probably about a year ago when, when, when Kanye was put into a mental hospital. Oh yeah. He had that supposed breakdown on stage when he. Yeah. So he, had a, was he was just, at yeah. a concert. He said all sorts of controversial stuff. And then um, the next day he was with his trainer and he was, I don't know, something physical. And they brought him into the hospital on handcuffs and he was there for like a couple of weeks and all this strange stuff. And then he came out and he started talking in a very kind of new agey love and light sort of way, which what you made reference to. So to me, two things, you know, and immediately the 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 response from the. Uh, social conspiratorial perspective is like uh, Kanye was brought in for uh, re-education for his MK Ultra handling. Like he went off, he went off script, um, and they brought him back in. And then, like, because this is just this is the this is how powerful all of these different mechanisms are. I mean, I'm as guilty of it as anyone else. Is then people's minds have been conditioned to question every single thing which is given to them, like. Well, maybe they want us to think that. And this is Kanye is just like what you're saying with pro wrestling. That's Conway's shtick. Like his shtick is to go crazy. And SNL shtick is to cut him off so that everyone could go and videotape it on social media. And so it's like, again, back to the CIA thing. Remember, CIA, all state level, all state level um, espionage goes back to john d you know they all have the same roots and and the cia quote which is you do not know what reality is you can't tell what what's the real and what's the what's the the counterintelligence and 
I do enjoy watching the show, and I certainly try to navigate it um, to the best of my ability, but I don't know. It could be all of those things. Well, I think the major point here is, I don't know. (laughs) Neither of us knows. Nobody knows. I mean, there are probably some people that do know, but it's not us. We're just speculating here. And Have have you ever met Kanye West? No, I don't know why I would have. <laughs> why, why, ha, have you? Neither have I. Okay. So my entire understanding of Kanye West is as a two-dimensional character, which has been given to me on a liquid crystal screen. Yeah, that's true. But most celebrities then, you could say, most people in the mainstream media, whether it's Hollywood, politics, it's, you know, whatever, UFC fighters, pro wrestlers, yeah, I mean... Most of them exist in this, like you say, this liquid crystal environment that is delivered to us for our own entertainment. Exactly. And, and I, you know, I, I don't know if that was the point you're trying to make, but I'm like, yeah, I'm, a, uh, I'll, let me end it on this, on this thought. Cause we can keep on, I love this conversation, but I, it would, it would go on for, for a long time because this this all ties in it all ties in and it's really approach of understanding what we're seeing on the liquid crystal screen and this ties in so much to what tracy was saying like in terms of we don't know so i can't get over the fact that trump is president and I say that not from like a, a a moral or ethical, like how can this man be president? I say that in terms of how this character, and I say that with quotation marks, has been introduced to me and the public and how it's been strung along. And it's so it's so ridiculous that that I, you, you just can't even take it seriously. So the name itself, like, you know, Trump, you, 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 you're from the Midwest, you play Euchre, you know, Trump means like you, you, you get the final word, you got the Trump suit. The guy's name is that he enacts that as a personality. And then for 10 years, they gave us this absolute ridiculous notion of this show called The Apprentice, where they create this idea of like, if this was a real person, this is who he would look like. And and he would sit behind this table and people go and present him situations and <clears throat> everything about it. I'm like, this cannot be real. Like, this is a script. Everything lines up to it. I don't know if he's real or not, but I'm just saying like how ridiculous this is. Um, all of it, everything which is being presented to us is, is if there was a quantum computer, you know, if there's a simulated reality, if any of this would be true, like this is what it would look like to me. Yeah, and you can't deny also Trump's uh, connections to pro wrestling again. And and t- and time travel, like he's connected to everything. I don't know his pro wrestling oh, connection. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, uh, he had Trump Plaza in in Atlantic City hosted WrestleMania four and five. He also he was also involved in what they call an angle, a storyline at WrestleMania. I don't remember, like twenty two or twenty three, maybe, where uh, he and Vince McMahon had this. Had they had two two wrestlers represent them in, uh, in a match and the loser got their head shaved which is a traditional wrestling trope the like uh hair like hair versus hair matches are just historically yeah. important for some reason it's probably a symbolic meaning oh, for that a, too the, the head the head shaving is is a major part of the humiliation ritual like you know that was the britney yeah. spears sort of thing you see that over and over again that also ties back to the psychological programming of of the 16 candles she didn't have her head shaved but she had it cut off but you're the fact that i didn't realize that trump had that connection with with wrestling but it just further strengthens like you can't how can we take any of this seriously they keep on it keeps on pulling you in it wants there's a no there's a there's a gravity there's a a a black hole which and what i mean by that is it pulls you in that wants us to take stories which the only reason we know they're real is because we saw it on liquid crystal or we read it in a book but nothing like 
for, for real. And we know it's not like it's they keep on showing this indication when I say they like the nature of our reality keeps showing that there's this ridiculous falsehood to all of these characters. Yet at the same time, it's also pulling us in like, well, this is as real as it gets. What else is it? Well, but yeah, he's my, your president, oh, and 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 he used to be in wrestling, but he also owns all the buildings, and his name says yeah. this would be the guy who owns all the buildings. And he had a TV show, and the whole TV show is fake, but this TV show is called Real, and it's like it's this constant feedback loop between conscious and subconscious, and confusion, and da 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 da, and all of these different archetypical stuff, and here we are in the center of it, as individuals watching the wheels go round and round. Well, Mike, this was, at the very least, thought-provoking. And <laughs> if if people want to yell at you on the internet for this, where can they do that? Um, they go to SusquehannaAlchemy.com. Um, uh, that's probably the best place. All right. Well, yeah, and while they're there, they'll find a whole bunch more shit about John D., and time travel and the general mystery of the modern age, I believe. So uh, I do appreciate you reaching out to me with with that email a, a couple of days ago and being willing to come out here and talk about it in a public forum. It's not easy to talk about this stuff like you said up front without getting sort of emotionally uh, quote unquote triggered by these things. But uh, I think we just all need to take a step back in general as a as a collective and see like you know try to figure out how ex- what exactly is going on here and how it applies to our lives and if it's if it's really worth the the hate that we're spewing towards each other on the internet. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that to wrap up here, but uh, that's just where I'm at with it right now. Ryan, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. This was a fun conversation. I know it went places we did not anticipate, which is what I think makes it the most amount of fun. And I think that your podcast in particular provides a very, very interesting um, platform to discuss in uh, in a, a safe way, like the really weird stuff which is going on. Yeah, well, you're welcome back anytime. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. That's all. That's all. I I, I want to thank you for that. I I you know I'm a I'm a big fan, and I love your guests, and I love being part of this community. Well, you're welcome back uh, anytime to talk about anything. So I, I do appreciate <laughs> you. I mean, like I said, you were driving, you pulled over to stop and and finish this chat, uh, and I do appreciate that. So I'll let you go right here, so I can get back on the road. Uh, take care of yourself, for real man, and. Uh, I don't know. Best of luck with your work here. All right. Thank you. And same to you, Lorraine. Talk to you soon. All right, man. Bye. See ya. All right. So that was Michael Wan. Apologies for any technical issues there or background noise or whatever else. But wow. Not even sure what to say about that in summation here. I guess it's better for me to not say anything and just ask you what you think of this. Does this sound just fucking crazy? Does this resonate at all with you? I'm still sorting through it myself. I will say that this is a raw episode that is typically posted for patrons on Patreon at the $5 level, but I thought it was best to share it with a wider audience because of the potential value it may have to some of you and the implications that it may have on a cultural level. So again, sort through the ideas and make of them what you will. Please don't shoot the messenger here. Mike and I are not interested in being added on social media with your expletive-laced responses. We're just speculating here on deeper meanings of what's playing out in media and culture and general entertainment, which podcasts like this do all the time. And it's important to question things, everything. There's not always a deeper meaning to things, but you know sometimes there is, and you don't know that until you start asking questions about it. But anyways, my time is up for right now, so until next time... You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.